Hey everybody, welcome to Wild Care. It is Wednesday and we have a very cool program for you today. What's happening today, Melissa? We are going to take uh, talk about some of the features that make a falcon a falcon and distinguish from a hawk, let's say. Aha. Uh -huh. So what does make a falcon a falcon? Well, let's start off with a silhouette. So I have a picture here of a red-tailed hawk and a falcon. Um, falcon silhouettes have pointy wings, okay? Yeah. And they're more compact. These guys are built for speed. Uh, whereas the red-tailed hawk there is a soaring hawk, right? Sure, so nice broad wings. Broad yes. wings, fanned out tail, or these uh, peregrine falcons here, of course, the fastest animal on the planet. Yep. So they're built for speed. Yep. So shape of the wings is the very first noticeable if you're looking up in the sky and trying to determine if it is a falcon. They have very long toes oh. in comparison. Oh, by the way, we should introduce oh. our friend here. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is Kaylee, Kaylee, our American kestrel. Kaylee uh, came to Wild Care in 2011, and we believe that he was habituated, meaning that he was raised by humans, um, because he was landing on um, people at uh, picnic benches. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Yep. So um, we believe, though, he was probably a little bit older when he started doing that. So we don't know if he escaped or if they let them right. they let him go or what happened. Right. Another good example of why wild animals do not make no. good pets. Oh, wild is supposed to stay in the wild. Yep. Exactly. Sorry about the wind, everybody. I hope my hair isn't causing a muffling sound. So anyway, uh, how do we tell a falcon from a falcon? So we do the. Uh, so we talked about the silhouette and the wings, and he is just getting a little picky there with his anklets. So we'll give him a little bit more jest. Excellent. Um, the feather structure is also different. If you compare a falcon feather to a hawk feather, the uh, falcon feather is more stiff, um, less wind resistance. Again, built for speed. Sure. Long toes, um, especially pr uh, predominant on or most noticeable on the peregrine falcon. Yeah, looking at Kayleigh's feet here, he does have slightly longer toes, mm -hmm. including an amputated toe. I remember that when that happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for the peregrine falcon, the long toes are really good to go through um, the feathers of a duck or a goose and hold onto the body. Oh, sure, absolutely. So these guys are grabbing their prey out of the air, huh? Yeah, so they, um, and the prey for a American kestrel mostly are insects. So dragonflies, grasshoppers are a favorite. <laughs> um, they will take smaller rodents. Okay. Um, also birds, and I've seen them with little snakes as well. Oh, interesting, sure. So very varied diet, which is great for um, any predator because you know you never know what there's gonna be abundance of, right? And then we look at the beak. So all raptors have a hooked beak. Yep. Um, but for hawks, it's more predominant, comes out a little bit more, and then hooks at the end. Whereas the falcons, it really just hooks right off the bat. And then there's also a little notch but behind his beak. It's called a tomial tooth. Okay. And the way that that works is I call it the can opener. Because <laughs> what they do is when they, let's say, if they grab a songbird, right? right. They take that tomial tooth, they hook it underneath the neck of the songbird and they rip the head off. Wow. Yeah. So wow. You would not think that someone as small and charming as Kayleigh here would be doing that. Yes. Yes. Tiny but mighty. Always. Tiny always but mighty. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, and then falcons have either a stripe or in the case of the peregrine falcon, um, a black cheek and the stripe is called a malar stripe. Okay. It works like um, baseball players, or maybe you see football players with a black grease under their sure. eyes. Sure. Right, so they don't get this. Now, does that actually work? Yes. Does it? And they got it from falcons. Wow, okay. Um, so they don't get the, um, the sun in their eyes. So what happens is if this uh, falcon is chasing down an, a songbird, right? Songbird might try to go up into the um, sun to blind the falcon. Doesn't work. It's like wearing sunglasses. Oh, so interesting. Yes. That's really cool. Yeah, and he has actually double. So he can have double, a single, or like I said, with the um, peregrine, they can have that black cheek. Hmm. Um, now with the castrol, uh, there's always an exception in nature. Usually when we talk about raptors, we talk about the female being bigger than the male. Right. Except when you come to the kestrel. Oh, is that true? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they are actually different in coloring. So um, he's a male and we know that he's a male because he has this beautiful peach chest blue on the wing. I love that slate blue. That's one of my favorite, favorite colors. And if I have his feather here, he dropped one of his feathers. Okay. Is he molting right now? He is molting. Okay. And you see that black band on yeah. the tail feather there, right? And that's for, uh, only for males? That's only for males. Ah. So if this were a female, they would have several little um, 
thinner black bands. Okay. Um, they'd have a lot more of the um, little <laughs> teardrops on the chest. Not so much blue on the wing there. There we go. There we go. Um, so, but they're the same size. So it's color. Oh, that's really that's interesting. Yeah, because really for most of the raptors, we are able to tell what sex we're looking at mm -hmm. based on how big they are. And in the wildlife hospital, we have a basically a weight range. So if he's mm -hmm. between X and Y, then he's a, he, he's a male. And if it's the animal's bigger than that, then it's probably a female. So that's that's generally how we tell that. But yeah, the kestrels are very, very different. The females have a lot more of the rusty red on them. Yes, yes. And um, he weighs about a stick of butt or two. <laughs> is that all he weighs? Yeah, that's why I weighs over. It's like, oh, a stick of butter. So if you hold the stick of butter, that's the weight of a kestrel. Um, so let's see what else. Are, uh, we've got the tail. The tail being a little bit longer also than um, the uh, soaring hawks. Sure. Um, makes it more maneuverable, right? Makes it more maneuverable. Uh, the American kestrel can be found in open country, um, farmland, in our urban areas. Um, and you can imagine that's a lot of little obstacles that they've mm, got to get through yeah. there. So that really, and if you're chasing down a bird, if you are a predator bird chasing down another bird, you've got to be extremely maneuverable. Right. You're going after some very maneuverable prey. Definitely. Prey on the wing. I can't imagine how challenging that would be to hunt. Yeah. And you know, I, um, also too, when you're talking about hunting, you know, people think that um, our misconception about raptors is that every time that they go out for a hunt, they are going to kill. Okay. Um, they really don't have that high a success rate. Oh. Maybe 20%. Wow. So only 20% of the time mm -hmm. that he actually takes off and goes after something, he actually gets something gets, to eat out of it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So generally for most raptors. Um, Those so are not great odds. They are not really good odds. That's a hard job to be a falcon, Kaylee. It is. The um, animals that are more successful that uh, at um, hunting and, and getting a kill are um, African wild dogs, actually, I think. Are the oh, top. interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a question from Rosetta. What size of prey can they catch and can they get something that's bigger than themselves? Yes. Um, they just can't carry it. And uh -huh. what they do is they uh, just tear it up bring Ooh. it back to the nest stash food they can also stash food as well interesting it was a revelation to me during one of our live streams that we i love how i learn something every time we do these together uh but it was a revelation to me that the peregrine falcon can take a duck yes it's yes. a gigantic bird compared to the peregrine falcon so the way that the peregrine falcon takes um down a duck or a goose for that matter sure. is those long toes that's where those long toes also come in i'm um, not just grabbing the body mm -hmm. but they can um make a fist out of those toes and right. they will hit them in the head. You hit anything in the head, gravity takes care of the rest. Sure. What about kestrels? Do they do that? Um, you know, I've never seen a kestrel do that, but yeah. um, doesn't it might be a technique yeah. that they have. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, um, but yeah, so they... Uh, but that's well, funny that you'll, you'll, you'll catch something that's bigger than you are and you can't fly off with it. No, but you Especially can. with your maneuverable narrow wings. Right. And so, you know, I mean, it just, it just depends on also where they catch them. I mean, if you catch, um, you know, the prey right behind the head, then that's doesn't really matter what size it is as long as you get it right. in the right spot. With your long toes. With your long toes. And although I'm wearing a really um, light glove here, you know, for a little mouse, that's pretty powerful little talent. Sure. It's all Absolutely. relative. Absolutely. Let's get it's a all little relative. closer here and see if we don't want to obviously make him any more nervous. So the wind's kicking up, so he likes to, he's like, oh, let me open up my wings. Yeah. And they have a really um, cool flight pattern um, hovering. And so they can hover right, right above um, maybe a field looking for mice. And they can see in the ultraviolet range, which means that mouse urine pretty much glows in the dark to them. Oh, isn't that interesting? Right. So they just follow that little trail of pee. <laughs> and they can uh, they can locate where that mouse is uh, that's also um, other birds use that in um, the animal kingdom uh, some fruit that they can see also has a uv reflection to it and also insects so it's not just for, for oh, mice urine that's interesting yeah but i had heard about that about about mouse urine and of course one of the mm -hmm. things that we all know about rodents or maybe we don't i learned this uh is that they they don't have bladder control they pee every 10 seconds they basically are walking around whittling all the time yes right. so leaving that ultraviolet signature that yeah. that birds like kaylee can see now is he mostly oh look at that head turn upside down that's impressive kaylee yeah. he can do he can turn his head 180 degrees okay or we so do the 90 he what does was the owl again 270. 270. Significant difference in his neck vertebrae. But I thought that was interesting. He he turned his head upside down and mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty darn flexible neck. Very flexible neck. Mm -hmm. um, and right now he's probably just, just like any predator, you know, keeping an eye out in the sky for any other um, maybe crows, ravens, hawks in the area. Sure. Definitely. I just saw him do the bobbing behavior. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? Focusing. Oh, is it? Mm-hmm. 
when they do the like this yeah that's focusing and then when the owls do this this is the hearing when sure. they're trying to triangulate oh um, for sure because that is one of the ways that you can tell a kestrel mm -hmm. you know he's sort of a smaller bird so when you're out hiking uh oh, rosetta wants to know are they smart yes 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 um i think we we talked about intelligence and how it's all really relative sure um they are i mean um you know he's he's intelligent in the way that you know he's great at calculating distances and mm -hmm. all of, making all those little uh, minute corrections to be successful at hunting um, and the variety of food and um, he only takes what he needs to survive which I think is a great sign of intelligence right yep um, interesting so yes, I believe, yeah I believe he's intelligent mm -hmm. yeah but I was saying a way to tell the kestrel uh, when you're out hiking you'll mm -hmm. often see them on the telephone wires so you see them like at the Las Galinas ponds a lot you'll see them up on the telephone wires mm -hmm. and they do kind of that bobbing rocking mm -hmm. uh, pose that he's kind of doing a little bit of he keeps he keeps doing it yeah, just a tiny bob, bit tail bob. yep exactly and that's one of the ways that you can tell that that is actually a kestrel up there on yeah. that wire and yeah. if you look closely you can tell if it's a male or a female because mm -hmm. of course that's slate blue indicates that he's a male like Kayla here. Yeah, and I don't know if he'll let us see it, but he does, he can kind of see his, um, well, oh no, he's like trying to face the wind there. If you look, you see that he's grown in new tail feathers. Oh, I see that. Oh, isn't that interesting? Sure. So when we talk about molting with birds, um, drop a feather, grow in a feather, drop a feather, grow in a feather. So Kay. they do it systematically. Um, they don't drop all their feathers at once. So right. he dropped this one, grown in another one. That's so interesting. And does he molt every year? Yes, they molt every year. Um, but in, you know, and doing it systematically, especially if you're talking about flight feathers, you know, will alter their flight slightly. But if they molted all their feathers at once on oh, one sure. side, that'd mess up their flight. Oh, yeah, sure. And again, that unbelievably low success rate for mm -hmm. their hunting, mm -hmm. if you're only successfully getting something to eat, yeah. 20 times out of the 100 you go out, or two yeah. times out of the 10 you go out. Right, right. Right? Make sure my math is right. Yeah, even even um, lions are not that. Yeah. You would think they are yeah. because they're group hunters, but um, but they're, they're not as successful as African wild dogs. If I remember right, it might be wrong, but um, I believe that what I call kill rate for uh, an animal um, or successful kill I think the African wild dog is, I want to say, at 95 to 97 percent. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. Right, and these guys are at 20. And this well, is why it's, it's hard for, um, it's hard to survive. We talk about, you know, uh, the wild is brutal, you know. I mean, if you only have that small little success rate there, you know, you're out hunting all the time. You're out hunting all the time. That's pretty much what he does all the time, mm -hmm. is be looking for prey. Yep, yep. And Absolutely. And, um, you know, these guys, um, they're also going down uh, in population as well. Mm. Slight decline in them. Um, could be numerous things. Could be a, a, an imbalance in nature. Too many predators. Um, also, pesticides? I, pesticides, I think yeah. insecticides. I think if your, your diet is, is mostly insects, of course, you know, agriculture and protecting that crop and everything like that. Not that I'm saying that's you know, don't get me wrong, you know what I mean? But I think with the using of insecticides and rodenticides and everything like that. It's affecting these guys uh, it's too. It's definitely affecting them. Um, and affecting them, it's not just uh, insecticide. They also eat rodents, so they get the double whammy there. From the rodenticide as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, lots of threats. It's so wonderful to have this opportunity to see Kayle up close and learn a little bit about him. Everybody, thank you for joining us. We're gonna be back on Friday. Don't know what we're doing on Friday, but it's gonna be awesome. Uh, join us again at one o'clock PST. You can visit us online at discoverwildcare.org. Kayleigh's waving to you. Everybody have a great week, a great, a great week. Everybody stay well, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you on Friday. <laughs>